Welcome to Climate One at the Commonwealth Club, a conversation about America's energy, economy, and environment. To understand any of them, you have to understand them all. I'm Greg Dalton. Californians have many choices as consumers, but they don't have a choice of where they buy their electricity. Electric monopolies owned by investors, or in some cases, local government, deliver the juice to our homes and offices. Most people don't think about it except when they get their bill or when the power goes out. Climate disruption is changing that. Concern about carbon pollution is causing people to pay a lot more attention to what powers their smartphones and flat screen TVs. One aspect of that awareness is a move to open up retail electricity markets to give competition and give consumers options for the first time. Marin County has the state's first power choice program up and running. It costs more than PG&E. Supporters say it's cleaner. Detractors question that claim. San Francisco is close to going down that road, and Sonoma, Monterey, and Santa Cruz counties are also sniffing around the idea. Over the next hour, we'll discuss the promise and the reality of clean and or local power with our live audience here at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco. We're pleased to have with us four people who are deeply involved in this area of the energy sector that is formally called Community Choice Aggregation. Kim Malcolm is director of Clean Power SF, San Francisco's effort to offer an alternative to PG&E. Sean Marshall is a member of the Mill Valley Council and executive director of the Local Energy Aggregation Network, an advocacy group. Marcy Milner is senior regulatory manager at Shell Energy North America, which is providing power to Marin and negotiating a deal with San Francisco. And Hunter Stern is business manager with the Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, a main union in the electric industry. Please welcome them to Climate One. Thank you all for coming. Sean, let's begin with you. And can you please give us the context of uh, local power moving away, providing some competition, uh, some choice for electric uh, utilities monopolies around the country? Then we'll get into California and the Bay Area. Great. So uh, Community Choice Aggregation, or CCA as it is commonly called in California, is one opportunity for local jurisdictions to take over their uh, electricity supply on the generation side while continuing to partner with the incumbent utility. In this area, that happens to be uh, Pacific Gas and Electric. Down south, it's Southern Cal Edison and also San Diego Gas and Electric. So we are seeing um, a tremendous increase in the adoption of community choice aggregation across the country with now thousands of communities um, aggregated under various um, supply contracts and also moving toward a greener supply through CCA across the country. And are these small towns or the big cities? Who's doing this? It's everything. That's, that's what's so exciting, I think, about the opportunity of community choice aggregation. You see towns as small as three to 5,000 uh, in Massachusetts uh, aggregating and um, cities as large as, as the city of Chicago that recently signed an aggregation contract, um, gosh, in February of this year, and that's a no-coal contract. So we see everything from the smallest town to the largest uh, U.S. cities. Kim Malcolm, why does San Francisco want to do this, and why, why are you supporting it? Um, well, the city and county of San Francisco has always had strong environmental policies. Its board of supervisors voted to create the CCA in order to provide residents and businesses with the option to have 100% renewable power product and to um, have a product that would be um, free of greenhouse gases. In the case of the city and county of San Francisco, um, there's also a policy to build out local resources, um, specifically uh, solar, wind, and uh, energy efficiency products for residents and businesses. So this really is the government getting in the energy business. Is that fair to say? Yes, in the case of San Francisco, the government is already in the energy business. It produces about um, between two and 300 megawatts of power from its Hetch Hetchy uh, hydroelectric project um, in Yosemite. And that powers Muni and a lot of the city and wants to go, go further. Yes, okay. most of that power is um, to provide energy to the municipal properties in the city. Hunter Stern, are you pro-choice? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so. From your perspective, oh, wait a minute. you're talking about energy. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah energy. <laughs> no, we're pro chase that too. In terms of the um, job aspect of this, right. union members, is this a threat to jobs? Is this more jobs? How does that it, shake up? It, I think the short answer is we'll see, but the way that the Marin uh, example has gone forward, it, it 
it is not um, the, the opportunities for jobs and the opportunity for local build out and the things that create those jobs locally and throughout the state uh, hasn't occurred. And we're concerned with those aspects, but we're also, we've adopted here in San Francisco a resolution from the Labor Council supporting CCA and, su and supporting Clean Power SF, but not supporting the current contract structure. And not supporting Shell in particular, Correct. right? And wh why are you opposed to Shell being involved in the energy business in San Francisco well, or anywhere in California? Uh, well, part of it has to do with the contract itself. There's language in the contract that says that no new local facilities need be built. Uh, and that obviously is a job threatening kind of language. Uh, it doesn't mean, I guess, that it can't be, but that's been the, the, the result in Marin, at least to date, which is three plus years. Uh, and I think um, we also have a strong uh, support and direction toward California-based generation and local-based generation. And Shell is a purchaser of electricity from a variety of sources in and out of state. So what it sounds like so far is the union and the city of San Francisco want to generate electricity locally in San Francisco, perhaps other places. Uh, Marcy Milner, let's get you in on this. Uh, how does Shell come into this? I think of Shell largely as an oil and gas company. Um, a lot of people don't know why that Shell's in the electricity business. Well, uh, Shell Energy North America actually markets natural gas, power, and environmental products. And so really, this is another um, customer for us to serve. We're, we're very pro uh, Pro-choice. We, we like the ability for customers to be able to choose. We're an energy service provider in the state. And um, as, as Hunter mentioned, our, our contract um, may say that it doesn't have provisions for local, you know, but what the, what the contract actually does is it creates a bridge to renewable en uh, energy independence for the CCA down the road. So it helps them get on their feet in the interim, and then it's up to the CCA to, to to build those resources. So, but for example, in Marin, we serve uh, Marin Energy Authority, but um, we're one of more than 12 providers that actually supply some energy. So it's, it's, you know, the competition, I think, is the good thing that brings prices down for everyone. Okay, so Marin is the first in the state to kind of go down this path. Let's talk a little bit about that. I should clarify that we invited people from Marin multiple times to participate in this panel, and they declined. So we'll, but some people up here are, are involved. Um, um, Sean Marshall, tell us what's happening in Marin. Is it going well? Are people paying a lot more? How many people have, have opted out or stayed with the, the Marin Clean Energy Program? Um, so what, at first as a disclaimer, just so everyone is aware, um, I was a founding board member of the Marin Energy Authority. I'm no longer serving on that board, left that board to do uh, the work nationally related to community choice aggregation. However, I remain, uh, I track what's happening in Marin and what I can say for sure, and, and I also want to introduce uh, Justin Kudo, who's here from the MEA, who can answer questions later. Um, what I can say is that now with the addition of the city of Richmond, Marin is serving a customer base of about 100,000 customers. Um, some of the, uh, most of the residential customer base is actually right now less expensive than PG&E's power. Um, and I think, I believe that uh, much of the commercial is also under uh, the price of PG&E's power. So the statement that MEA is cost more is generally an untrue statement. That can be true depending on the time of year because PG&E moves its rates up, up and down several times a year. Marin Energy Authority sets its rates annually. But for now, Marin Energy Authority is less expensive than PG&E's offerings. I believe they also um, continue to be at least double the renewable content of what is offered by PG&E. Because I've heard of people in Marin opting out because they think it costs more. I mean, Hunter, is, do you know about the price in Marin? Uh, I, th I think that Marin has to answer that, uh, honestly. The, the people who are putting it in the bill, um, I, I don't, uh, we don't know for sure. I think that people have expressed that concern in the past. And I think there have been times when Marin has been higher priced, but they they do change their rates uh, as PG&E changes rates. So, Marcy Milner is is uh, is from Shell's perspective. Is the Marin uh, really? It's, it's a pilot. Is that a success? How's it working from from yes, your perspective? Yes, we think it's a success. And and um, you know, really, I think the key point here, Greg, is that it provides the customers' choice. And so, for Marin, for example, the customers can choose whether or not they want a light green product or a dark green product, and then they pay according to that and then Marin goes out and procures that energy, um, just like PG&E does. I mean, PG&E 
also procures energy on a wholesale basis. So if you want to be really green, you're going to pay more, but you want to be kind of green, then you pay a little less. Correct. Is that the way it works? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, Sean? Actually, I would say everyone in the Marin Energy Authority customer base is twice as green as what they can get from the incumbent utility as a baseline light green product. And then if you want to pay a little more, I pay $5 a month more at my home to enroll in a deep green 100% renewable product. So that's where the differential comes in in Marin. Hunter Stern, there's biomass uh, is one of the possibilities. Uh, that's burning things, diff many different types of things. In some parts of the country, it's coal, probably not in Marin. Uh, is, is, it, is it, what, let's get your response on that. Well, I, I think uh, the answer of, of how green green is, is really the, the source of the electricity. So biomass as a source is highly polluting uh, and, and pollutes. Depends on what you're burning, right? It depends on what you're burning, but it can be up to higher uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions than coal, depe uh, depending on what you're burning. So I, I, think, I think the difficulty that Marin has uh, to date is that they haven't done a review or a study of exactly how green their uh, energy is. So I don't think anybody really knows um, how green, and there's an assumption in, in this discussion, at least at the moment, which is if you have renewable energy, it's therefore clean energy or greenhouse gas emissions free. And that is not an accurate assumption. That's not the way there is emissions. Certain wind and solar, absolutely 100% greenhouse gas emissions free. Other sources, biomass, um, uh, there's uh, other, other gases that come from landfills, uh, high in emissions. Sean Marshall, do you know how many people have opted out or stayed with the, the clean energy program in Marin versus gone back to PG&E? I don't have the current numbers, but I'm um, estimating that it's been about a 20% uh, opt-out rate, maybe slightly less. Um, I'm not sure what the current enrollment is in Richmond. And the way the law is written is that people are automatically steered into this new com clean community energy, and they have to then actually actively go back to the uh, monopoly. Is that right? Correct, and that is a, a common, uh, the opt-out provision is common across the country with all statutes across the country for CCA. Kim Malcolm, you're sitting here in San Francisco watching this experiment up in Marin. What have you learned? What is San Francisco going to do differently or the same uh, looking at Marin kind of broke the ice on this? Um, San Francisco's plan's a little bit different from Marin's uh, because our Board of Supervisors has uh, directed us to provide 100% renewable product. Uh, that's number one. Our product. So San Francisco is going to be cleaner than Marin. Okay, we got that. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Um, our product, for that reason, partly for that reason, our product is um, more expensive than Marin's, um, up to about 30, 30 percent is our estimate right now. It's it's hard to tell until we get going, um, and our product is also a little bit more expensive because we're trying to layer in some reserves so that we have funds to build solar and wind projects locally. Uh, as well as undertake some major energy efficiency projects. And where does the, pro the process stand now in San Francisco? People have been around a, a long time. This has been talked about uh, for, for many, many years in San Francisco. It's been on again, off again, up yes. and down. So I'd where does the saga stand? There's a, tw a twinkle <laughs> in the eye of the bo Board of Supervisors in 2004 when the California Public Utilities Commission was uh, developing its rules. Since then... Um, there's been a lot of planning going on, and uh, it's a political process. Right now, um, I've been before the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission with a couple of options for uh, rate levels and resource mixes um, options. And um, I'm going back on July 9th. OK, so mm -hmm. it's inching forward. Uh, is this a done deal or no? Uh, it's a done deal. As far as the Board of Supervisors goes, yes, it's, uh, they adopted this program. They approved um, an outline of a contract with Shell Energy North America. And um, as far as I know, it's a done deal. We invited uh, David Campos, a supervisor, who's one of the champions of this, to uh, participate in this program. He declined. Some people infer that some of the supervisors might be getting cold feet, I mean, less enthusiastic than they were when they voted for this seven or eight months ago. Anything to say about that? Um, I don't know personally about the um, changing views of the elected officials. I'm, uh, what we're trying to do as staff is to provide them um, with answers to their questions about um, rates, resource mix, build out uh, plans, 
And uh, get when you say them, build out, them. that means what does that mean? Build out means uh, we take funds that we get from the program, or um, we might get funds from bonding, and uh, and build local resources that would um, provide energy to the CCA um, that would be sold to local residents and businesses. And what's this going to cost people who want to be clean and green in San Francisco? How much more are they going to pay? Um, right now, PG&E's basic energy rate is about eight cents. We're expecting that um, our program would cost about 11 cents, a little more. Okay, so all 40% more, something like that. And there was a survey in, in February of 2013 where about it found that about half, 47% of the people would be willing to do that. Is that still yeah, old? Yeah, about half. And we're going to target neighborhoods where we found the most uh, openness to uh, this, the green product and paying a little extra for tier one customers, which are the smaller users. Uh, the bill impact would be about $6.50. Marcy Milner, you're, you're, uh, Shell is negotiating with the city. I'd like to get your take on sort of where the process stands and where you think it'll go. Um, well, as, as Kim said, I think, you know, the supervisors have already approved it. And um, keep in mind when, when she indicated that the price might be a little bit higher, it is 100% renewable energy as opposed to PG&E, who is currently, you know, buying the state mandated 20% renewable energy mix. Okay. That's a big difference. And so what's the time frame for when this might actually be up and running in San Francisco? Um, from the date we get approval for rates from the commission, the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, we need six to eight months to launch because we have to do a lot of customer notification. We have to give customers three chances to opt out, um, and they can do that in a variety of ways. And um, we have a, a public education campaign that we're going to conduct as well that the mayor's asked us to uh, conduct. Hunter Stern, uh, your union has a lot of workers, what, 10,000 workers or so at PG&E. PG&E uh, spent $50 million on a statewide initiative trying to kill this kind of, uh, this kind of thing that, that failed uh, quite, right. quite noticeably. What's their position on these kinds of uh, things? They're really quite small. Kind well, of yeah. I. Boy, again, uh, like I don't want to speak for Marin uh, Energy, I don't want to speak for PG&E. Um, our view is that PG&E has overreacted to these kinds of, uh, of, of developments or ideas, the idea of a CCA, um, and that proposition was the biggest example of an overreaction. Uh, we advise them not to do it. Um, but um, at the same time, I think that the one issue that is um, important for people to understand is that the, the CCA law gives the decision making to uh, local elected officials. Very few of them actually have any experience in the energy industry. And so it, it becomes incumbent on, on a very uh, uh, complicated process being uh, taught to them through consultants that are hired by counties and cities, uh, you know, some of whom who are in the business of doing that work. So it's it's a, tough, it's a tough decision and one that I don't think very many of the electeds fully understand. Hunter Stern is a business representative, representative right. with the Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. We're talking about local and clean energy at Climate One. Our other guests today are Marcy Milner, regulatory, senior regulatory manager with Shell Energy North America, Sean Marshall, executive director of the Local Energy Aggregation Network, and Kim Malcolm, director of Clean Power SF. Hunter Stern was just talking about some of the elected officials not being in the energy business. This is very complicated. It's not what they do. Uh, a person who works in San Francisco city government said to me about this project, do you really want the people who run Muni to run your electricity? And there was a slam on no, Muni, but I mean, really think about this is, what's the, what's the government doing getting in the energy business? You, you want the people who've been running Hetch Hetchy for the last hundred years um, doing this work. Uh, the people of San Francisco have been served by city government um, in the form of the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission for 100 years with power, um, not to residents and businesses, but to uh, municipal um, properties and also to some large business customers like um, the port and the uh, San Francisco airport. But the idea that the elected officials, are, are the taxpayers going to have any financial liability for this? If the, if the city's going to get in the energy business, is there going to be some kind of no. whoops where like, oh, we built this and now it's a white elephant? No, the program has been designed according to the Board of Supervisors so that it is a standalone. It, has, it will have its own books of account. Um, 
it's been given some upfront funding just to get it going, but otherwise, um, and, and in fact, those funds come from the Hetch Hetchy project revenues, not from uh, taxpayers. Where's the opposition coming from? Why is this taking so long? Uh, well, there's been historic opposition from PG&E uh, over at the State Public Utilities Commission, and I suspect behind the scenes. Um, there is some opposition right now from... Uh, we should clarify, we invited PG&E to be part of this program as well, and PG&E declined also. Mm -hmm. so. um, Mr. Stern's organization has been keeping us on our toes um, in terms of uh, it, its concerns about the shale contract. Um, I Do think, people, you know, are people concerned about Shell? It's a big, bad oil company. We, like buying clean energy from Shell seems like not quite the right thing. Is that? Um, uh, well, many have that opinion. Uh, the Shell contract is designed to be a transitional product. We're actually looking right now at ways we can do a lot of these purchases and scheduling of power in-house um, with the Shell contract so that we can build out the program a little bit more quickly than we'd originally planned. Uh, there, um, I mean, the idea is to get ourselves off of a Shell contract and um, more independent. Marcy Milner, you're from Shell. Uh, yeah, you can me, respond to that. I would like to, actually, um, <laughs> because really we were one of many competitors that, that went in through this RFP process and, and successfully won the bid to serve the city. And I would just ask that, you know, you also focus on all of the good things that we do. We have a, we have, um, taken a lot of efforts on, on global warming. We were one of the only energy companies uh, in California to support the climate change legislation. And uh, we've been very active in, in renewable procurement on behalf of the state. So there's a lot of really good things that, that we're doing here. I, I would and they know how to do big projects like this, whereas the city of San Francisco, well, you say they yeah, would, some people say they don't. Okay. Um, I would also add that, that Shell's been good about um, helping us find resources that uh, meet some of the concerns that we've heard um, in state resources, unionized resources. Um, we're still in discussions with them about that. You're still negotiating a price with Shell? A, a price and a product. And is, if that negotiation doesn't happen, then uh, is, does this thing fall through or do you get someone else? Where's it go? I'm really confident that it's gonna, going to go <laughs> forward. <laughs> Because, as Kim mentioned, we've been very, we've, we've worked very well together in trying to be responsive to whatever it is that they need. Sean Marshall, do the people in, in Marin have any issue with uh, Shell being a, a provider? I guess there's lots of other providers uh, of clean energy. Uh, not anymore. Not anymore. I mean, you know, of course, unfortunately, Shell, Shell gets drafted with a historical logo that, you know, represents gas and oil. And you all are very well um, familiar with that. But I have to say, when we went through this, you know, there was some PR pushback, primarily. Um, but I would say that in Marin's case, the partnership has worked out quite well with Shell. I do think it's really important to reiterate what Marcy had to say, which is, in Marin's case, Shell uh, has a five-year contract to get us started. And then uh, Marin has since um, entered into 14 more power purchase agreements for brand new uh, renewable resources in state in the state of California. So I think that's important to really understand that it's a, it's a mixed procurement approach and um, we espouse that for all CCAs in the state and across the country. So let's talk about that because this could be clean energy but it could be from another state, from somewhere else. Is this not, it's not necessarily gonna be local, is that right? Well, I think, Marcy I mean, Miller. that again, that's dictated by state policy. What, what current statute allows is for um, load-serving entities and obligated entities to procure energy from in-state and out-of-state resources. And the statute actually tapers out-of-state resources over time with a, a more emphasis on, on in-state. Hunter Stern, imagine you want it to be in-state. Well, uh, yeah, the, in fact, that's, that's been the, the gist or the push that the IBW and other unions and environmentalists have, have made for, for years here in California. There's a policy that the state has pursued. Uh, we want more in-state uh, renewables. We want our members doing that work. Uh, I don't think anybody's disagreeing with that. I think it's how we get to 2020 and beyond when the state is gonna rely on much more energy produced here in California. But, but I, you know, and, and Sean mentioned a couple of things um, 
about Marin, they have, and since Sean's left the board, but they've extended their agreement with Shell on three different occasions. So it's now going to run into 2017. And I think that's, that, those are our, it, it, it's not, in Marin, they're not producing those local jobs and those local projects. And that's fundamentally our interest. Um, they've had one uh, project, I think, uh, thus far. But how, local sometimes can cost more. And there are some people right. who'd say, for example, if we can build uh, solar in the Nevada desert and it can be cheaper, why should California be parochial and, concern, and mandate that it, it happens in state? When so, you're really concerned about something like global warming, it's a global <clears> issue, <throat> and <throat> the, the atmosphere doesn't know whether those well, energies <clears throat> are made in Nevada or California. Yeah, yeah excuse me. Just to, and, and to answer the concern, and, and that's, a very, that's a very important aspect. And in fact, if you look at state law and, and, and Air Resource Board CARB uh, work, everything that goes up in the air is considered the same. So we're looking to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from all sources. Um, the advantage of electricity ha happens of, of de generating it locally and e even on larger scale within the state has to do with the characteristics of electricity. So electricity moves and it's more efficient for us to use it closer to where it's generated. So pushing it down lines from, from Nevada and Idaho and, and Washington is essentially a waste. You lose, through drag, you lose electricity. Look, so th that's the goal. So where are the electric utilities in all this? Uh, w if there's going to be more choice, more competition, uh, their customers are becoming their competitors and suppliers putting rooftop solar and, and Walmart putting rooftop on their roofs. What is, where are the electric utilities? What's their role in this emerging model? Marcy Milner? You know, I guess my view is that um, the utility's primary business model is to make money on their assets, which is the transmission and distribution system. And so they get a guaranteed rate of return on the power lines. And that's, um, you know, that's really what their business model is. So any kind of uh, power procurement, they should be indifferent to. Because with the CCA model, for example, it's just another wholesale power transaction. It's someone else buying the power. If that's true, why have they fought this so hard? Kim Malcolm? Um, well, first, just to put this in perspective, the phase, phase one of the San Francisco program would um, provide about 30 megawatts to local residents and businesses. PG&E provides, at peak every year, 20,000 megawatts of power, um, not, not with all of with its own facilities, but it either purchases power on the market or um, produces that power for its customers. This so, is a drop in the bucket. Um, right now it is, and uh, I think Marin's serving about 140 megawatts of load, so between us it would be under 200 of 20,000 megawatts. Um, I would say, based on my work with the state PUC, I'd say, you know, the utilities are very protective of their monopolies and their market share, and um, I think they're representing their shareholders in that way. Which is their job. Yeah, Sean Marshall. And, and I would say that it's very worth noting that um, in every other place in the United States where CCA exists, you don't have the utility opposition at all to this model. And it is for the reason that Marcy stated in that they've already restructured. So the utilities are doing what the utilities, in my view, should be doing, which is upgrading the system, focusing on the grid, uh, transmission and distribution, and leaving the uh, generation side of the business to the open market. The results of that across the country traditionally have meant significantly lower rates for customers. So community choice aggregation can take advantage of that group buying power. And then our job, or that's where lean comes from, is really teaching then how do you layer on, how do you layer in uh, the, the green and local distributed generation component to all of this. So we see competition as a good thing, and we think that utilities, hopefully over time, um, will begin to um, separate their functions such that you've got the generation that's an open market function, and that utilities really focus on the nuts and bolts and underlying pole and wire infrastructure. So there's people <coughs> who kind of make the electricity and other people who, who move it around and, and distribute deliver it. it, deliver it. Sean Marshall is a member of the Mill Valley Council. Uh, tell us what's happening in Sonoma, Santa Cruz, Monterey, other areas in the Bay Area that are looking at this. Um, there are a number of other communities up and down the state that are in various um, places in terms of their investigation of CCA. Excuse me, uh, let's see, Santa Cruz, Monterey, and possibly San Benito are coming together to look at forming a more regional approach 
to their CCA that's led right now um, by the city and county of Santa Cruz. They are in the midst of raising money to get their first um, technical study done, which really looks at not only how can we integrate local renewables, but can we be cost competitive? Because, you know, no matter what, it's mostly uh, important from an elected point of view and also from a constituent's point of view to not pay a whole lot more, um, even if it's green power. So, so price competition really matters. Um, they're looking at it up in the Arcata Humboldt area. The city of San Diego and the city and county of San Diego is moving ahead. They've got, I think, some really promising discussions underway with the IBEW and a, um, a solar developer down there who is looking to integrate not only the CCA component, but solar build out on their municipal and school buildings while using union labor. So what we see is every time a CCA is coming online, they seem to be improving and learning from one another and continuing to set standards, I think, that are um, replicable across the country. Hunter Stern? Well, <clears throat> I think uh, all good ideas, and especially the work in San Diego, Sean uh, rightly points out that um, the discussions in San Diego with the mayor's office and the IBW local there, uh, really promising. Um, the concerns that we've had, and fundamentally speaking, uh, IBW doesn't see electricity as a product. It's an essential service that people need. I mean, we just, the way we live our lives today, we have to have electricity. And there is great concern and probably well-founded well for large utilities uh, providing those services. On the other hand, there's also a great deal of oversight. There's workers who are trained to do that work, and whether it's generation or the delivery, um, but all of those aspects are important. Price issues, the way that Marin and other, age, uh, other areas are, or in this case Marin, is making the prices so that relying heavily on renewable energy certificates or RECs. Um, and those are, they, that's not electricity as much as they are a financial instrument. There, there are benefits or attributes that are considered environmental and positive, but they don't put people to work. So we, uh, it, both the IBW and, and unions in general in the state, as well as environmentalists, have, and it's why we have the policy we have here in California, where we're real work, steel on the ground projects here in state and locally, and trying to limit the amount of wrecks that are used. So if you're comparing CCAs from other states, it's probably not a good comparison, especially in view of the fact that the state of California has a 33% RPS renewable portfolio standard requirement which other states don't have for the most part. And CCAs may or may not be a good result. Uh, long term, maybe, but short term, we're not seeing it, at least in the job side. So is that a big factor here? I mean, how big a factor is California has this 33% goal, which is quite an ambitious it's a, goal? It's a mandate. Everybody has to do it. So it, it, I mean, that's what's driving a lot of this innovation and, and production of, of renewable energy. And I think everybody in California agrees. Um, again, as I said earlier in, in the discussion, it's, it's how do we get there? And there is this balance of cost, because regrettably, right now, renewables cost more to produce. Um, and especially renewables when we're going to have to build new generation facilities. So that's additional cost. So how do you balance that out? And the, the programs utilizing high amount of RECs and, and the San Francisco program. RECs, again, these are so basically financial derivatives, sort of uh, fungible <clears throat> electrons. Yeah, well, there's, there's it's, it's, there are certificates. They're created when renewable energy is generated. Um, the problem is, is their history. Some of them come right out. You can buy them bundled with the electricity that's produced that, that gave rise to the, the wreck. Um, and those are, those are probably the best um, because it, there's, it's evidence that, that something, a positive environmental attribute was, was created. Um, there are other wrecks that are floating around that, that were, gener were created when renewables were generated you know, five years ago, seven years ago. Marcy Miller, you're in the trading business. Let's get you on, on the price of renewables and also anything you're right. responsible for. Well, I, yes, I just wanted to add that, that, you know, again, state law dictates how much has to come from, from bundled generation versus a rec only product. And, you know, over time, that decreases, I think, to about 15% or 10% by the end of 2020. And uh, currently, at the maximum amount of, of rec only that you can use for the renewable portfolio standard is 25% uh, through the end of this year. And then that, that amount decreases. So I think, you know, really the intent of the policy is to make sure that, 
you know, there is renewable energy generated that's, that's either brought into the state or generated in the in state. state. Right. And Marcy's absolutely right. I think that the, the concern that we have is, is again, recs don't produ necessarily produce jobs. And in a state where there's a mandate to get to a certain amount of renewable energy, those projects are going to be built anyways. But the other side is, is and San Francisco's current policy is going to rely heavily on, on recs, which for years and years and years the city wasn't doing. They were actually had a different path and a different, something that was probably we could support more readily. Hunter Stern is a, is a business representative, representative with uh, the IBEW. Kim Malcolm, you want to get on this in terms of uh, whether this is real energy or not, really clean energy? Um, yeah, first I'd like to clarify that the San Francisco Board of Supervisors um, approved of a CCA with the explicit commitment to the local community and the build out of local resources. Um, and the jobs that come with the construction of solar projects and energy efficiency improvements. Um, Mr. Stern's correct that RECs, um, you can argue that RECs aren't as green in some ways as some other products. Um, first of all, the city hasn't made a commitment to any level of RECs, high or low. Um, we're trying to give our commission a number of options. Um, but second of all, all of the energy products um, that are being bought and sold on the market right now are part of financial markets and contracts. And it's, um, it's, it's a rather nuanced distinction for most of us. Um, the state of California and the federal EPA have approved of RECs as renewable energy products. Um, and that's why we can call them, um, if, to the extent the city does buy them, um, our our product that we will be selling to local residents will be 100% green. Although, and just, just to finish, and Kim, Kim is... We're going to uh, get off Rex because my head's starting uh, that, to hurt. No, that's fine. I, I was just yeah. going to say that, that Kim, <laughs> yeah. Kim is, is relatively new. So with regard to local build-out and jobs, as late as March 25th of this year, the SFPUC acknowledged through discussions with the commission and the staff acknowledged that there was no plan for local build-out. And so uh, they're presenting those kinds of plans currently. But as of March 25th, there was no plan, and that's why we have concerns about the program today. Uh, this is a bit of a tangent, but I want to ask about San Onofre. A big part of the state's ele electricity program is going to go offline. Is that gonna, that's a big news in the state. Electricity may not directly relate to uh, community choice, but Hunter Stern, that's a big jobs issue. Right. Is, and it also raises a question about where that supply is going to come from. Right. I, well, two, I think there's two aspects. It is absolutely a big jobs issue. There are uh, IBW members for, from a different local and also members of the Utility Workers of America who work at that plant and they will all lose their job. And I, I don't know off the top of my head uh, how many jobs there are, but there are, some will stay longer to help decommission the plant and, and maintain that site, but it, they're gonna lose their, their work. Order of magnitude, there's about 1,000 people who work Yeah, there. Yeah, well, there's, there's over 900 I, um, union represented workers there. I just don't know how many go mm -hmm. to which to which. Um, in terms of supply, uh, the state, and this is, again, the state ISO, the independent system operator, would be the best so source of the answer to this question. They had a, they had a um, temporary uh, plan to uh, provide power last summer and last year to, to, to the state, Southern California. Uh, they made it through pretty well without much trouble. I think they think that they're gonna be able to do the same thing, but it, it actually, it creates an opportunity for, for the creation of new renewables uh, the people in Southern California are actually behind, uh, no slight intended, but there's more uh, renewable generation and, and higher use percentage of renewable energy in Northern California than Southern California. And in fact, a number of the utilities down south <clears throat> from, in the public sector use a fair amount of coal power from, from Utah. So it's an that's opportunity- That's being phased out, but yes. That, that, but that's, those, these are opportunities to make that, that occur faster, right? Sean Marshall? So, so I want to pick up on something you just said, because I think one of the things that we haven't really discussed here and really where the true power, pardoning the pun, um, the true power comes from community choice is really how a community chooses to structure its uh, request for proposal or RFP. And what that really means is that depending on the, the policy set by the local governments, whatever, you know, whether it's a policy to, to meet or beat PG&E's price, have a greater renewable resources, have local build out over time, have enough excess funding to do electric vehicle charging stations, 
We see jobs creation right now um, with training folks for solar and uh, energy efficiency upgrades in Marin County. All of that can be enabled through the CCA, but the key driver here is the RFP. And so that taking that RFP out of just the, the big rubric of a large monopoly utility and being able to customize it and say very clearly, what is it that our community wants to buy through CCA? That's where the power really comes in. And then you can layer on how much of that should come from union resources. So I think it's really important to understand all of the um, multiplier effect, if you will, or optimizers that can be realized through CCA to achieve all the various goals we've been talking about today. That's the payoff. The obstacle is it's hard work, it's complicated, it and it takes some money up front, and it's hard for politicians to figure out the electricity market. But which some is of us do. Some, okay. <laughs> in, in Mill Valley, they're smart, yeah. Um, <laughs> Sean Marshall is a member of the Mill Valley Council. Our other guests today are Marcy Milner, Senior Regulatory Manager at Shell Energy North America, Hunter Stern, a business representative with the Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, and Kim Malcolm, Director of Clean Power SF. If you're just joining us, you can get a podcast of this and other Climate One programs in the iTunes store and follow us on Twitter with our handle at Climate One. We're gonna invite your participation and put a microphone that's over there. Uh, I'd like to, to have you come join us with uh, one, one part question or comment. Let's go to our audience questions. Welcome to Climate One, yes. Hi, uh, Brendan Steele with Future 500. I was wondering if you could quickly compare and contrast California's initiatives with those of other states. Sure. Sean Marshall? <laughs> California leads the way. California sets the bar for the rest of the country. And this is not really so much a community choice aggregation or it's often called municipal aggregation issue. It's really driven by influencing legislation. Let's just go right to the, the a renewable portfolio standard. In other states, RECs, not that we need to go back there, but RECs count as 100% green energy. And so really we need to be looking at how we um, adjust the RPS so that the aggregation contracts can follow suit. Rex being rene renewable, renewable energy, energy certificates or credits. <clears throat> Let's have our next audience question. Thank you for that question. Welcome. Thank you. Um, you can hardly walk around this city without noticing that we are constructing enormously. Uh, could any of you address what all this new construction is doing for electricity? Are any of these buildings getting solar panels or other um, built-in electricity savers so that they won't create a huge new drain? Kim, uh, Hunter or Kim Malcolm? Who, well, uh, 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 either one. Your, your guys uh, would be installing them. Yeah, so. well, well in, installation. But, you know, the, the, the best and, and most uh, easily attainable um, goals in terms of energy, uh, energy, uh, renew more renewable energy and energy efficiency, energy efficiency are these new uh, building codes and building standards that, that San Francisco has long since adopted. Um, the IBW has a lighting system uh, certified by the state, lighting system uh, plans and information, and of course, uh, IBW uh, signatory contractors that, that install those systems. Um, but it's the only system that's currently uh, state certified as, as, a, as, as a lead uh, qualifying. Uh, so there are absolutely, hundred, literally hundreds of different steps that a new builder, a new developer can implement, not just in buildings downtown, but in new homes, especially new homes, uh, that can make those, those buildings uh, and homes more energy efficient and therefore reduce the rate at which we need to increase generation of electricity. So in both sides of the equation, reducing, not so much reducing demand, but limiting the uh, increase in demand through uh, energy efficiency and then m meeting more of that demand through renewable sources. All of that's, all of that's important and the IBW supports that 100%. It's work for our members. Kim Malcolm, anything to add? Um, I would just add that uh, PG&E, shout out to PG&E, also has some really good programs for new construction. Um, in residential and, and commercial buildings and, and industrial buildings also. And uh, y y things have evolved and continue to evolve where uh, technologies are less expensive and more is known about how to, um, how, to, how to build buildings in greener ways and um, that use less energy. So um, it's, it's becoming part of the fabric of the um, architecture, architect community and the engineering community. 
And one footnote to that is that uh, if to the extent that those people are not living in the suburbs, uh, people who live in urban areas have a much smaller carbon footprint than people who right. live in car-based communities where they, they drive around a lot and have larger, uh, larger footprint. Let's have our next audience question. Welcome. Hi, uh, John Easterday, San Francisco. I'm going to start with the comment, then I'll ask my question. Um, if all those new rooftops have an option to build, shouldn't it be a requirement that they put solar on instead of just a choice? That's my comment. Here's my uh, question. Two years ago, I put in solar. My power bill is zero. It's incredibly local. No drag from my rooftop to uh, my house. I'm thankful that PG&E is there as a big battery to give me power when I'm not making it. Uh, it will pay off. My capital asset pays off in five years or less. Then it's $3,000 a year forever. Two big surprises when I put in that solar. Number one, how affordable it was. Number two, how poorly that affordability was communicated throughout all of the solar literature. Um, in your local things, I'm not quite sure how local your local is, will there be an option for people to buy power from their roofs, um, either through helping them understand what the options are and or helping them finance it? Thank you. Who, thank you for that question. Who'd like to uh, tackle that? Kim Any Malcolm? of us? Yeah. Um, well, first, um, yes, congratulations on having solar. Um, a big part of Clean Power SF's uh, strategy is to develop solar resources in the city, and that would include rooftop solar. That's what they call behind the meter, which is what you have. Um, so you can avoid transmission and distribution costs on your bill. Um, one thing we're looking at right now is how to design a tariff or contract so that we can buy your extra power for um, at, at a price that's economical for our customers and also very attractive to you. Does that answer your question? No, e e either sorry. One, but the, either one, the idea of anyone else here on this uh, like to get to that, Sean Marshall? Marin County is already doing that. It's net energy metering, so people with rooftop solar absolutely can uh, use the credits for themselves, sell their excess back into uh, the pool, and then Marin Energy Authority will buy that excess. But the Marin's net energy metering project product is actually less expensive. Um, it's a better deal for customers than PG&E. It actually pays out better. Uh, there's no $4 charge and all of that. So it's highly encouraged. And I believe the number of net ener energy metering customers in Marin is about 2,400, about 2400 now and, and on the rise. Yeah. So yes, it's very much enabled. And Understand? no, it, we obviously for people who are installing solar, we hope you use a union contractor. Um, but be, but beyond that, um, we're interested in in what effect that has. Because Kim mentioned that that uh, currently the way net metering works, and all almost all utilities in the state provide it, is it bypasses costs that the rest of the uh, ratepayers who don't have uh, solar on the roof have to pay in terms of transmission and and dist and and. Um, uh, generation costs. So is, is that, does that raise an equity issue that, it, so I have rooftop solar, for example, that it, if there a are, lot of people do that, then, then there's other people who are paying there, for the there grant are, or not? It's actually, it's, it's not so much our issue, but there are people who raise that issue in filings with the PUC, yes. And CPC. certainly it's something to consider in planning, yeah. in utility mm -hmm. infrastructure planning. People should pay for it, as the gentleman said in the question, pg and &E is a big battery. There ought to be a, a, a fair price for using that battery if you net out right. zero at the end of the right. year, as my house does, uh, that we, it's not a free battery and shouldn't be. There ought to be a way that someone pays for that and they get paid for that. Mm -hmm. Well, and the utilities, are, are. The yeah. utilities are currently working on, on um, that through various proceedings at the, at the Public Utilities Commission to ensure that if, you know, even if you're going to spin your meter back and, and deliver power to the system, you are still using the grid. And so right. there, you know, there needs to be some way to get some, some equity out of that. But as I understand it, these days, people can't be a net producer. If, if a household right. produces more energy over the course of a year than it generates, the utility pockets that difference. Is that correct? It gives you a credit on your bill. Right. Now, yeah. in, Marin, in Marin, you can actually have a payout of that excess credit. And that's what's different. For example, with PG&E, they, they will not pay that out. It's just a credit on the bill, and it gets pretty convoluted between electricity and gas and hard to frankly trace. In Marin County, that's tracked and then paid out at the end of the year. And the people who are generating this electricity, they uh, sell it 
during the day when they're uh, at a uh, wholesale price and they buy it back in the night at a retail price. So they might sell it for five cents and buy it, buy it back at night yeah. for 10 cents, right? Right, that's essentially how it works, that's right. And it, it's, like everything else, it seems to be, it's pretty complicated, but it's, the idea is good and that's why, there's, that's why we're encouraging. Let's have our next audience question, welcome. Uh, yes, a few parts. Um, and I couldn't understand everything because of the abbreviations. But uh, Shell is an oil company, so I don't understand what uh, kind of energy that they have also available that's, that's green. And uh, I saw the film Pandora's Promise, which is for nuclear power. Um, I, I still think it's, it's too dangerous uh, so I'm not for it, and I don't know, you didn't speak much about that. And I may need to get uh, uh, gas and electricity soon, so if I don't want to go with PG&E, which probably uses more oil and is not very green, um, what, who can I call? That's, so a couple of questions there. Is there, so the, is there an alternative on natural gas? But first off, uh, let's go to Marcy Milner and, and Shell, uh, which actually has sold off a lot, a fair number of its clean energy assets. Uh, Marvin Odom was here recently, the president. So there's, uh, it, while it's gone into gas, there's less renewables in Shell as a company today than there was a few years ago. But Right, well, we are definitely known as, as, as an oil company globally, but in 2012, our natural gas production actually surpassed our oil production. Um, and while we may not own the assets for renewable energy, we do have access to all sorts of renewables, including wind and solar. Uh, we do still have Shell Wind as an organization. And, um, you know, really one of the benefits of doing business with Shell is that we have the ability to go to developers that need financing for their projects, and we agree to buy that power and take it to market. And when we do that, then they can get their project financed and built. Anyone else want to comment on, on the, the nuclear obviously well, would not count as renewable. I don't right, think in anyone's right. contract. Hunter Stern? Yeah, and well, on, on the nuclear, the, I think the reason the mo movie uh, was made is because nuclear is greenhouse gas emissions free, and there's just a, a, a much greater premium and just beyond interest. It's almost an urgent need for more sources of energy, electricity, that, that don't produce greenhouse gases. Um, I think the politics in California preclude any kind of a, of a large-scale nuclear uh, building and so we're not pushing for anything like that. Although it's against that, state law. It's against state law. So they'd have to change the law. And, and that was an initiative. And I don't see a lot of people running around saying nukes now. Um, there, so, there was a, a pilot in Merced. Uh, Riva was trying to get something going there. Right. Didn't go very far. Okay. Didn't go very far. Um, the, I have to say that the, internationally, the, the IBW as a union across the country is supportive of those approaches, but we don't see that happening here in California. And to answer the, your question, ma'am, to answer your question, PG&E is the provider here. PG&E is, is relatively clean in terms of its sources because it does have a nuclear plant. It also has a large hydro uh, system. These are not greenhouse gas emissions. They're, I'm sorry, they're not considered renewable at all, but they are greenhouse gas emissions free. And PG&E is one of the greenest utilities in the country, right? Y yeah, the, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, I'd love to say that they planned it that way, but that's not the case. But they are, in fact, uh, very green. Uh, the, the energy that they provide uh, emits v relatively low greenhouse gas emissions compared to other large utilities throughout the country. In fact, they're the greenest that way. One other piece of that question was, will people have a choice on where their natural gas comes from? We've been talking about electricity. Uh, is that in the offing anywhere? I, for what we know, um, no, because, well, no and yes. Um, no, because it's totally deregulated in the sense that uh, natural gas is, is transmitted um, via the, the source and, and into the state, um, and people can get natural gas from other providers, but it's, it's not really a, a very developed marketplace. I guess that's the nicest way to put it. Um, right now, it's, people will literally knock on your door and say, would you like natural gas from XYZ uh, provider? So it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't seem very reliable to the customers. And there's no real greenhouse gas benefit, right? I mean, if you can understand, if you're buying cleaner power that's addressing climate concerns, then you might pay some more of that. There's a reason for that choice, but natural gas from company A versus natural gas from company B, 
am I missing something? Doesn't seem to no, RC commodity. Mill. Commodity. Right. No, I mean it's the same. It's the same carbon mm -hmm. value. But I would say that natural gas is extremely clean when compared to coal and other technologies. Right, right. And so the state is going to need more natural gas facilities in order to to be able to firm up some of these intermittent renewable resources like wind and solar. So when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, you have natural gas to back that up. Uh, natural gas versus coal depends on the methane that's released during production, and so it, it can be cleaner, and there's really quite, we've had lively debates here about ca gas versus coal, depending on how that's measured. But Marcy Milner, uh, how much of a potential uh, does Shell see in this electricity business? Do you see this as a, a growth area in California with these other counties? I mean, pretty well, big company, you have to see a pretty significant market to want to get into this. Well, again, I, I think, you know, uh, you know we, we've been very supportive of competition in general, and so it's it's more customers to sell to, but but the load itself doesn't change. So, in other words, we're not really seeing, you know, and we're not seeing an increase in customers, we're seeing a change. So it would be a wholesale power transaction, renewable energy to the CCA, as opposed to a wholesale renewable energy transaction to, to the utility. But um, we, we like more buyers and sellers in the market because that creates lower prices for everyone. And so, you know, we, we'd love to see new customers, new entities develop. Uh, let's talk about during the electricity crisis a few years ago, people remember the brownouts, et cetera. Uh, if people go to the community choice route, are, are they going to be more vulnerable and a better position if we have that kind of brownout situation? A lot of people said last time that the munis, the cities who actually owned their their assets, Palo Alto, Sacramento, et cetera, they came out better in the electricity crisis than some of the investor-owned utilities. Is that is that true? Uh, yeah, I, I believe so. Um, having some measure of yeah. energy independence, um, especially for San Francisco, which is a little bit of a transmission island, um, being able to rely on its own resources would protect it from uh, market price shocks. And um, perhaps reliability, although it's a very complicated engineering question um, as to how uh, a reliability problem in the bigger system might affect San Francisco. Anyone else on that? Um, well, we're coming to the end here. We have a few minutes left. Let's just t look into the crystal ball. Where is this going to go? Is it going to be? Is this something that's going to spread across the state? Is it going to be sort of so isolated? Uh, liberal urban areas are going to do this, and the rural areas are not going to do this. Uh, let's. Wh where is this going, uh, both within the Bay Area and, and statewide? Kim Malcolm. Um, well, we're certainly seeing um, a lot of interest in a lot of communities now in California, and a lot has changed since Marin got going. Marin sort of did a lot of bushwhacking for the rest of us in terms of how things operate and um, what kinds of products local communities want and how to serve them. Um, I, w I, would, I would expect... But some people will look and say, well, that's San Francisco, we're not doing that, they're crazy well, anyway. Well, it's San Francisco, right? it's Marin, it's San Diego, it's Santa Cruz, it's Monterey, it looks like it could be Napa, it's been the San Jose or San Joaquin Irrigation District. Um, okay, they're not crazy. I, okay. I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, you know, elected officials are going to look for opportunities to um, be responsive to their community's interest in low-cost green power and um, local jobs and... Um, this is one way to do it. It's not for every community. But Sean Marshall, low-cost green power, that's often a contradiction. Oftentimes, green power does cost more. Yes. And, and so that's why we talk about the need to have a balanced portfolio. And, um, and so that is the mixing of actual physical renewable power, the bundled power that you referenced. It's um, using some combination of that. Rex, to some degree, within within Renewable energy credits, certificates, credits. Excuse me. Um, also, uh, using system, quote, system power, which is what runs up and down our transmission line, and then over time, really localizing that power. Um, but it's, it's really a, a balancing strategy that helps you be um, competitive, but also green up your supply at the local level. And Marcy Miller, you've talked about this a little bit, you, more customers in the marketplace. Do you see more traction on this? I don't know if your area is outside California, but California versus some other areas in the western U.S. or otherwise. Well, I mean, the demand is, is driven by regulation, and so there are a number of states that have, you know, RPS standards now, renewable portfolio standards, where they have minimum requirements that you procure a certain percentage of your energy from renewable resources. And I, I think that's, you know, really spreading across the country. So... Uh, and, that, and that's a good thing. 
So Hunter Stern, where do you see this going? And, and is IBEW going to support these or try to slow them down or sit on the sidelines? Well, I th the, we'll support anything that produces jobs for our members, uh, clearly. And to the extent that we can engage, you know, as Sean mentioned, San Diego is taking approach to actively engaging with the IBW there. Uh, in fact, there's a good chance we'll go down and talk to them, you know, a little bit uh, to make sure that the engagement's full. The Labor Council, the, the, the discussions we've had within our own, uh, in our own labor world is if, if uh, these project, if, if these ideas and these projects, the CCAs, support working people pr and provide jobs and we'll support them. That's the simple part. I think that the more difficult part is how green are these? You know, because again, no one has done a full review of w how green Marin sources are, how green San Francisco sources will be. 100% um, renewable qualified, um, using, because uh, uh, as Marcy said, um, RECs, renewable energy certificates, less and less are gonna be able to be used in the future, which should be good. It should mean that more, uh, more jobs and more uh, real renewables, as I call them, will be built here in the state. But by using them now, it makes it harder and harder, we believe, to leave that, that, that price structure that price point and then move into a, a renewable source, a 100% source. And Hunter, I would ask that you check with the Marin Energy Authority on the claim that they are not able to really track um, the sources of their power because I think actually that's untrue. Um, they, no, no, there's not, there's all kinds of account, third party accounting. I'm not gonna speak to it because I'm off right. the board now, but I think it's worth checking with the gentleman in the audience because I know that they have that information right down to the Electron, but, which is which is good. Or the kilowatt hour. But but I think that the I think that the concern has been that they haven't provided that in the form of how much greenhouse gas emissions are are those sources versus how renewable. You they should are. check with them because I think they do now. Well, Thank you. So, so are you saying that people can think they're buying clean power and it's not as green as people think it is? Especially with the use of of Rex. Well, except that I would, I, yeah, I would say that, that any time a renewable energy credit is generated, that means that one megawatt of renewable energy was, was generated. Right so you can't create the REC without having renewable energy behind that. And so, you know, as the states continue to increase their renewable portfolio standards, what that does is it lessens the use of fossil fuel generation, which is what the overall goal in California is through both, you know, its climate uh, climate change legislation as well as its RPS. So Marcy Miller, can you envision a day when electricity, clean electricity is a bigger part of Shell than it is today? Oh yes, I think you know that's, that's definitely the goal. I mean, as I said, we're one of the only energy companies that supported uh, the, the climate change regulations and we're doing things all over North America. We have a carbon capture and storage project in Canada that comes online in 2015 that will take a million tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere, so. Yeah, that's also at the tar sands, which is a big carbon bomb, but that's for, for another day. Uh, we'll have to leave it there, and our thanks to Kim Malcolm, Director of Clean Power SF, Sean Marshall, member of the Mill Valley Council and Executive Director of the Local Energy Aggregation Network, Marcy Milner, Senior Regulatory Manager at Shell Energy North America, and Hunter Stern, a business representative for the Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. I'm Greg Dalton. You can listen to podcasts of this and other Climate One programs in the iTunes Store. Thank you for coming and listening to Climate One today.